afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Middle East Institute. My name is Fanar Haddad, uh, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Mark Owen Jones today from the Hamad bin Khalifa University, where he is an assistant professor and where he lectures and researches on political repression and information control strategies. Uh, he's widely published on Bahrain in particular, uh, and uh, I, for one, greatly admire his innovative research methodologies on social media and the like. And amongst his many publications, he has a forthcoming book with Cambridge University Press called Political Repression in Bahrain, correct? Yeah. Right, without further ado, Dr. Mark Owen Jones. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Fanar. And thank you for the invitation here as well. This is my first time in Singapore. Um, I've been here a couple of days, and it's almost as humid as Doha, but not so bad. Uh, so thank you also for attending um, again during the summer. Um, as Fanar said, my name is Dr. Jones, which some people find amusing, uh, if you like 90s bands or in, indeed Indiana Jones. Um, but I'm not an, uh, an archaeologist, unfortunately. Uh, although I do like to unearth uh, fake news and, and that kind of thing. So there is an overlap. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about fake news, mostly in the Middle East. Uh, but a lot of the principles I'm talking about uh, related to fake news and social media are true of all, all, all platforms of social media and certainly um, all across the world. So we've seen fake news being discussed very much so uh, in the US, uh, Russia, uh, Europe. Um, there's been a lot of study done on, uh, as some of you may know, Russian interference in, in the US elections. There's been uh, studies done on unknown interference in Brexit in, in the UK and also British elections. Not much has done, been done on studies in the Middle East uh, and in Asia generally uh, in non-English language uh, sources. So my focus is very much on Arabic language disinformation, specifically on Twitter. And the reasons for that are, 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 I will talk about, but Twitter is an open platform. It's easy to research. But also Twitter is actually um, a more popular platform generally in the Middle East for sharing news and political information. So it's become a, a kind of both uh, a target and a, a, a sort of a more accessible resource to spread uh, fake information from. Um, so I mean, I'm gonna make several arguments in this, which are kind of, uh, I've outlined here. Um, I wanna say three things mainly. Firstly, since 2011, so I say 2011 because of the Arab uprisings. We've seen an increase in the use of uh, propaganda. We've seen an increase in the use of social media being used as a tool of disinformation. And one of the reasons I think this is interesting from 2011 is that during the Arab uprisings, in the early stages, social media, in particular Facebook and Twitter, was always kind of um, glamorized as a tool that would help popularize democracy. It would give people voice and it would allow them to challenge the kind of authoritarian and highly censored news media, which it did. But my argument has been very much that since that time, various entities and the governments have been able to co-opt social media in various ways and use it to deliver their own message. So both the state media and also social media are being increasingly weaponized as a tool of propaganda. Um, and in the case of Arabic language disinformation, the evidence so far would suggest that the discourse being promoted is one that promotes mostly Saudi Arabian foreign policy. Um, in some ways this makes sense, simply because Saudi has, uh, one, it has a lot of resources, it has a high population, but it also has, in, technically speaking, the highest number of Twitter users in the Middle East. So what we see um, from Saudi Arabia is, is that high numbers of social media users, especially with Twitter, they are in theory, able to mobilize this discourse, but also I, I will make an argument that the Saudi Arabian government have most likely invested in tools designed to promote uh, their foreign policy using social media. Um, and so hopefully that will become clear across my talk, but I want to talk mostly about three case studies. I want to talk about the Qatar crisis, I want to talk about use of sectarian language, and I want to talk about the Jamal Khashoggi killing. So in all these cases, I want to show you how social media, specifically Twitter, was used in order to uh, promote a specific message. Um, but firstly, in order to do that, I want to talk about what I focus on and how this message is promoted. So a lot of my work is on Twitter bots. Uh, 
and bots. I, um, I I'd like to define, I just want to make an assumption that maybe not everyone here is on the same page. So bots to me are just automated scripts of software, right? So on Twitter, you might see your Twitter account, it might look like a real person, but actually what it is, it's been programmed by someone to repeat certain information, or it might have been programmed to engage in certain behaviors, whether that's to automatically retweet something, to uh, tweet on a specific hashtag, to automatically follow people. There's all sorts of processes that a bot can do that are designed to uh, mimic, either mimic human behavior or promote a specific message. So bots uh, are essentially one of the big things that I focus on. Um, and there are different types of bots, and I'm, I'm gonna talk more about them now. But it's not, the, the notion of a bot is actually quite simple. And this is another, and an interesting argument about social media itself is Twitter would have the ability, for example, to combat and target this, to get rid of bots, but it doesn't, which is a question we need to ask ourselves, why aren't they doing this, uh, and for what reason? And so one of the reasons, um, at least one of the techniques I wanna talk about is trend manipulation, and this is what bots do. Does anyone here use Twitter, by the way? I know, I know Eliza does. Do you use Twitter? Yeah? Sorry, what's your name? Sin, and why, what do you use Twitter for? Um, mostly just seeing like some of the latest news. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you ever look at trends on all? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, a trend on Twitter is, is, is fairly straightforward for those who don't know. A trend is, is usually you'll see it on the, you can see in the sort of faded background of this. On the left hand side of your Twitter screen, you'll have uh, usually five, maybe 10, uh, hashtags usually, or, or keywords. And what these represent is what particular bit of information is trending at that time, i.e. what are people talking about? Okay, so for example, when there's a football game, um, you know, uh, Barcelona, Liverpool, um, you might see that uh, lots of people are talking about that game, so maybe Gareth Bale might, oh, not Gareth Bale, he wasn't clean. <laughs> clearly, I'm, I'm out of date with my football lingo. So I'll use a better example. But um, you might see a football name is trending because people are talking about him. People might be, uh, you might see Barcelona Man U trending because people are talking about that. A lot of people at a specific time are writing about this one topic, so it trends. Twitter has algorithms that select what content is becoming salient, and they put it on the left. If you want to find an interesting analogy, one way to think about it is like the trending section on Twitter is like newspaper headlines. Newspaper headlines generally are organized uh, with the most prominent news on the front, uh, in big writing, and that's what kind of Twitter trends are. They are the most prominent and important news. So whatever is displayed there would be considered what is being talked about by people. So, uh, what I want to, what we've seen in the Gulf, so is, is that these trends are being manipulated mostly by, well, or most likely by bot accounts, right, that are tweeting out specific information. I just want to give a, a bit more background on trends. In the Middle East, uh, certainly in the Arabic-speaking world, not every country has a trending section. So Saudi Arabia, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, uh, Lebanon, uh, Egypt, and Tunisia, Kuwait, they all have their own bespoke trending system. So if you're in Kuwait, or if you're in Qatar, and you don't change your location on your computer, you will see trends for that country. You can change your trends to, to be anywhere that Twitter has a trending location. The point is, if you're in Saudi Arabia, you will have bespoke trends based on what country you're in. And what we've seen in the Gulf is that the messages, or at least what my analysis has shown, is that the messages, these trending hashtags, have been manipulated to promote a specific agenda. So someone is manipulating these trends to send specific uh, messages. And we see banal things. We see political messages, but we also see, for example, people trending ad trend advertising services. So if you want your own bespoke trend, you can say, oh, if you want a trend, phone this number, and then you phone a number, and then, and, and then whatever you want is trending. I had a colleague who worked at the BBC, and we were doing this investigation together, and she contacted one of these numbers, and she was pregnant, and they got, uh, she asked them, can you make this trend? Congratulations, Fahima. Her name was Fahima because she was having a baby. So in Saudi Arabia, uh, for a very small amount of money, what, what, her name was trending uh, because she had paid for this service to do it. And in our analysis, or in my analysis rather, you don't need a lot of tweets. Some of these 
whoever owned these networks can make something trend with only uh, five or six tweets, right? So there is some way of getting this to happen with very, very few tweets. Um, but what we saw in the Qatar crisis was this was used to a huge effect. Now, I'll just give some background on, on the, the Gulf crisis or the Qatar crisis. Um, I don't want to assume that everyone knows about it. But I, I assume many of you are familiar that four countries in the Middle East, so Egypt, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, and Saudi, they blockaded uh, Qatar. Um, this happened back in 2017. Um, and since that time, they've maintained this blockade. So they uh, stopped all land imports across the border. They refused to allow Qatar Airways to fly across their airspace. They um, also uh, deported some Qatari citizens from those countries. And this has been main to, maintained to this day. The whole premise of the blockade was that the ruler of Qatar, Tamim, Sheikh Tamim, he had apparently, in an address to some soldiers who were graduating, said a few things that, uh, in particular, Saudi Arabia found offensive. Now, what Tamim had done, he'd expressed some support for Iran, which was seen as a red line. But what the Qataris claimed is that, actually, these words never took place, that um, the broadcast where this was evidence was a hack, and that some forces had hacked the national news agency in Qatar. They'd hacked their uh, TV account so that the ticker on the bottom actually read with this propaganda, and that their Twitter account, the official Twitter account, had also been hacked and tweeted out these messages. And most of us think, okay, this is far-fetched. When someone claims they were hacked, we're like, oh yeah, whatever, sure. It's just an excuse. Um, although it, increasingly there has been evidence to suggest that either the Emiratis or the Saudis were behind it. There's still some debate out on this. Um, but that's how the crisis had its inception. But also, when one studies propaganda, um, there's always a pretext. So if you look at the, uh, the Iraq war, it was weapons of mass destruction. You know, the, the British and the Americans uh, said there was evidence of weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, and that was used by the press to create popular support for the invasion of Iraq. It later turned out there was no evidence of we weapons of mass destruction. The classic example is Vietnam, Gulf of Tonkin. There was a whole manufactured crisis that then, the, the purpose of which was to get public support mobilized for uh, the war in Vietnam. So these are pretexts. Sometimes pretexts are true, sometimes they're not true. So the argument here is that the Emir's comments or this hacking was designed to create a pretext in which Qatar was seen as a dangerous force within the region. But in addition to these hacks, I was studying bots at the time um, unaware that this was going to happen, as most of us were. Um, and I stumbled across evidence that suggested that there was plausibility to the hack story. So what I was doing, I was downloading lots of Twitter data, and I was analyzing and studying these tweets and these hashtags. What I found is prior to the crisis, so a month before that, uh, we found a network of thousands of bots accounts that had been set up now, these accounts started tweeting when the crisis was announced, so when the, when the Saudi-led coalition announced the hack. These accounts, which were created a month before anyone knew about the crisis, in their biographies on Twitter, if it, most people, again, if you imagine Twitter, you have a biography where you put something about yourself, these accounts were created specifically to tweet against Qatar. So all the biographies inc included information like, we are anti-Tamim, we want the liberation of Qatar. So all these would have been created a month beforehand. And then they became very active during the hack, promoting certain information. So whether or not those two are connected, what is clear is that someone or some agency had planned well in advance of the hack the, the delivery of this propaganda message. And this, for me, was found completely by chance because I was downloading another hashtag related to the Middle East. I was looking at Saudis, then I just saw this. Um, and there were anti-Qatar hashtags beforehand. So I thought that was a very interesting example. Um, I just want to go ahead, yeah. I'm also going to talk about Trump. <laughs> but this, this was used to, to interesting effect. So what we saw was that accounts had clearly been created to promote a specific message. What were those messages? So if you looked at all the hashtags that were trending in Qatar, um, in Qatar Twitter, or even Saudi Twitter, for the six months following the crisis, and a month before, you can kind of code them on, on what the topics were. So there was um, dozens of hashtags that were specifically anti-Qatar. Uh, they were basically promoting the um, 13 demands made by 
the Saudi-led quartet about Qatar. So they were criticizing Al Jazeera, the news channel, because they claimed that it promotes terrorism. They were criticizing Qatar's relationship with Hamas because one of the arguments was that Qatar's relationship with these terror groups was one of the reasons that they should be isolated. So all these kind of trending topics um, that we saw in Qatar related to the political demands made by the Saudi-led quartet. So the implication would be that people in Qatar are talking about this, right? People in Qatar are criticizing Tamim, or they're criticizing Hamas, or they're criticizing their own government, because the whole notion of Twitter trends is that Twitter trends are meant to be indicative of what people are discussing, or what is popular being discussed. So for me, I, was, um, I became very interested when I saw this, uh, this hashtag here, which is Arhal Ya Tamim, which translates as, we want you to be basically. We want you to grow, as in, we don't want you to be our leader anymore. So this was trending in Qatar. The implication being that Qatar is one to mean to leave a new uh, rule. Okay. And the reason I came across this hashtag was one, it was trending, but two, um, it was being promoted by Sab um, Okay. Mukhabarata, listening. But it was being promoted by Saud al-Qatani. And some of you may have heard his name before. He was, uh, he was, um, he was a, an advisor to the royal court in Saudi Arabia. He was alleged, I uh, alleged because there was a lot of stories that came out after the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, he was alleged to have been Skyping into the Saudi consulate in Istanbul during the killing of Jamal Khashoggi. At the time of the blockade, he was the advisor to the Saudi royal court on matters related to information security. So he was always tweeting about inf uh, issues relating to communications, crisis, etc. Um, his reputation is kind of a bad egg, uh, for want of a better word. Anyway, one day he took a screenshot of what was trending in Qatar. So he took a screenshot on his phone or his computer, and he said, hey, look, look what Qataris are tweeting about. They're tweeting Arhal Yatamim, like the Qataris you know, want Tamim to go. It's the, most, uh, it's the number one hashtag in Twitter. Um, and then his next tweet was a veiled threat. His next tweet was along the lines of, if the um, Qatari government, uh, if they uh, impose themselves on the legitimate demands of the Qatari people, there'll be consequences. So he was basically saying, if the Qatari government, you know, try and stop a rebellion, there'll be consequences. So the connection was very clear. He was trying to say, the Qatari people want Tamim to leave, and if, if they interfere with that, there'll be consequences. So I downloaded the hashtags of this tweet to see what kind of information was. And there was a number of interesting things. For a start, the majority of the accounts, at least according to their location, were based in Saudi Arabia. Um, and a large proportion of those accounts were bot accounts. They weren't real people. Um, so there was two things. Most of the people talking on this hashtag were not Qataris. Uh, many of those that were were based in Saudi, and many of those that were were automated accounts. They weren't real people. There were Qataris using this hashtag, but most of the Qataris using the hashtag were actually, in this case, they were criticizing it. Whether those Qataris were real Qataris or whether they were working for intelligence agencies is not clear. But the point is, is that the message on the hashtag had nothing to do with the content, at least from the territory. It was, it was totally irrelevant. But someone who was close to the royal court, close to MBS, he was deliberately using this as a, ba a benchmark of public opinion, um, which is presumably what he intended to do. So bear in mind, this was um, this is another use of bots. So what? What bots can do is that they can promote specific hashtags that are unrelated to, unrelated to the country that they exist in. They can manipulate certain messages. Those messages that they manipulate will have nothing to do with public opinion, but they can be exploited to, make, to appear to be like public opinion. And that's certainly what happened. Um, just to show the extent of this uh, like bot kind of manipulation, I also wanted to say that at the same time, this, is, this was early on in Trump's presidency. So there was a lot of movement to try and, uh, you know, get, for, for, particularly in the Saudi Arabia, uh, for Saudi to get close to President Trump and to 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 use um, Trump's known hawkishness to enact or to to further their policy. So the Qatar crisis happened soon after Trump visited Riyadh. But what also happened was that Trump at the time was talking a lot about Iran, and as we know now, the the situations in in the Gulf and the Straits of Hormuz is quite tense. 
Um, Trump increased sanctions on Iran, and, and, and there's this constant escalation whether or not there'll be anything further in terms of war remains to be uh, seen. Yet from the beginning of his tre presidency, Trump was uh, vocal about Iran. And a lot of the bots that we saw in the Middle East tweeting in Arabic were also tweeting about Trump and Trump's position towards Iran. So and a couple of uh, online news sites, which are fairly reputable, they ran a couple of stories like saying, oh, Saudis, Saudis support Trump's war in Iran. And the evidence they used was based on, the, well, on Twitter hashtags. And so what this journalist had done, like lots of other journalists do, is they look at Twitter and they use it as a source of public opinion. And there were lots of Saudi accounts tweeting uh, after Trump tweeted, because Trump tweeted some criticism of Iran, and these Saudi accounts were like, yes, we support Trump, we support his aggressive stance towards Iran, uh, Trump warns Iran. And again, I, I examined these hashtags and I found that the majority of the accounts on these hashtags were actually bots. So they weren't uh, anything at all it, to indicate public opinion in Saudi Arabia. It was some entity who had obviously believed this message was promoting it. Uh, yet journalists were using it as if it was Vox Pops. And this is very common. So if you look at, I don't know, BBC Trending, um, uh, even Al Jazeera too, but lots of news organizations now have a section where they monitor social media and they use that to sort of see what are people talking about. So BBC Trending picked up this hashtag. They've picked up a few others that have been manipulated by bots. And, and, and the whole purpose is that they're saying this is what people in the region are talking about. I don't know if this happens in Singapore, if Singapore news sites, they have the same kind of uh, uh, social media kind of monitoring services. Um, but it's, it's a big problem. And you can't blame journalists all the time because there's so much information to be processed. How, how can they know if it's all reliable? I mean, they have a responsibility to do that. But at the same time, it's actually very hard to, 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 to kind of disaggregate all this every time you look at a hashtag to find what's fake. But what was an interesting example is when, and what this graph shows, if you see on the right, you have, uh, this was at the same, this was broadly the same time as Trump was tweeting about Iran, is um, I have great confidence in King Salman and the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. They know exactly what they are doing. So this is a standard Trump tweet where he praises some leader that he likes on that particular day. Um, he, he consistently does seem to like uh, King Salman, though. And it got retweeted loads, so I downloaded it, and I downloaded the rest of his tweets. So the, the green bars show uh, are basically the amount of retweets on Trump's previous and following tweets. The red bar is the amount of retweets for the tweet about King Salman. So I thought, okay, is this just a coincidence? Because clearly the red bar shows that a lot more people retweeted um, that bit of information. So I, again, I downloaded the tweets from that retweet. And again, thousands of the accounts that retweeted it were bots. So not only are we having bots manipulating trends, but they're also boosting information they view, or whoever runs those bots, they, they view to be positive of their client or, or, or whatever. Uh, so in this case, they wanted to emphasize the message that Trump supported Saudi Arabia and King Salman. Um, and this was a relatively sophisticated bot network. We knew that they were, you know, one of the, uh, this won't get bogged down in methodology, but one of the things you look for when you look at bot accounts is what platform are they using? Because often if, if you're a programmer and you program it using a computer, you'll, the interface you'll use would be like um, a web browser. And if that's the case, you'll be using Twitter web clients or Twitter web app. A lot of these bot networks were using Android or iPhone, um, which takes more resources and sophistication to be able to do. So this would suggest that a relatively sophisticated bot network was able to manipulate the timeline of the President of the United States. And this wasn't anything that made big news, but for me, it's actually pretty significant if the, the President Trump, his timeline is basically um, able to be manipulated by forces that uh, uh, there's no consequence to, to their actions. And Twitter does take bots down eventually, but usually the whole point of this manipulation, whether you're promoting tweets, retweeting this, promoting trends, it's a short-term goal. So once it's done, you maybe want it to be, happen for maybe a, a day or two, and then maybe a few weeks later, Twitter remove all those accounts, but that doesn't matter because your objective has been achieved by that point. So it doesn't matter. They, the person creating the bots will have to create new accounts. That takes resources, but they can still do it. So another thing that these um, fake accounts did was promote specific fake news. So if you look on the left, you can see a screenshot of a, a Reuters headline. Now try not to read what's on the right for a second. I know, resist the urge. But does anything strike you as slightly unusual about the, the Reuters screenshot? 
I mean, the headline looks quite authentic, maybe. The logo looks correct. Does anything seem slightly unusual? The figure? What about the figure? Yeah, different font size. Actually, yeah, that's a very good point. And, and your, your attention to font size and detail is also important. Any, anyone here was uh, fond of English grammar at school? What about Arab nation? What would you expect from Arab in that? Capital A. Yeah, capital A. They got Qatar with a capital A, right? It should, it should be plural. Yeah, yeah, the four Arab nations boycott. So for me, this was interesting because this was trending again on Twitter. This was the basis of a hashtag used during the Qatar crisis. Um, the, the hashtag was about Qatari civil servants, civil servants having their salary reduced by 35%, right? And then there was, there was one trope during the, the blockade where it seemed that whoever was behind this propaganda was attempting to make it seem that either the blockade was successful, i.e. that the Qataris had to reduce expenditure, reduce the salaries they were giving civil servants, um, or just try to demoralize potentially the Qatari population. Could be one of those things. But the, truth, the, the, the fact of the matter is there wasn't a reduction of 35% in civil service salaries. Yet this trended, this hashtag trended. It, again, it was picked up by, in this case, the BBC News aggregation service. They said lots of people in the Gulf are talking about this reduction in, in civil servant salaries. So I d attempted to try and trace the source of this story because I couldn't find it on an official news site. So I went to Twitter. And the earliest mention I found of the 35% figure was this screenshot. And obviously, once you know that this is special, all you have to do is copy and paste that in, in, in inverted commas to find to see if there's a headline, and it didn't exist, right? So you just copy and paste that and put it into Google. It does not exist. There was never a Reuters story on this. So someone had clearly, deliberately, created this screenshot to appear to be fake news. They had spread it, and it had spread to thousands and thousands and thousands of tweets. To, get to the point that people weren't even questioning whether it was real simply because, or probably because, it was a screenshot of what looked like a Reuters article. So it had this credibility. Uh, people didn't fact check it for that reason. And then it, and it spread, so it became a story incredibly quickly. Um, and the funny thing is that this, this was probably tweeted several weeks before it trended. So what happened was it, was it took a long time to go back, but when I found this, it was like weeks old and no one had really paid attention to it. And then, but it trended like several weeks later. So I don't know if they were banking on it trending at a different time or if they just expected, they thought if, if someone does investigate this, then there's, this is the source. But it goes to show that if even, you know, you can't take a screenshot of something that seems credible at face value. So another, uh, yeah. Yeah. There was meant to be a graph here, but that's my bad. Another thing that these bots do is, depending on how you use Twitter, um, I don't know how many of you do use it, but often what people do is, if they're interested in a specific topic, you'll type in a keyword to Twitter search things. So if you're interested in Saudi or Singapore or uh, Gareth Bale, to, to, to go back to that point, you might type his name in Twitter to see who's tweeting about him, uh, and the information will come up. And what happens when you tweet, uh, search for something on Twitter, you'll get uh, a lot of tweets on that topic. Okay, so one of the things that's also interesting is that uh, if you want to, in theory, if you were a reputation management person and you were interested in uh, Singapore and you typed in Singapore, what news might you see about Singapore? I don't know. But if you worked for a company, a PR company, you might be like, we want to promote Singapore in a positive way, so we don't like it if there's negative news about Singapore on Twitter. So what can we do? Well, we, can, we can't censor those people because maybe they live in a different country. Uh, we don't have jurisdiction over them. So what can we do? We can control the discourse. How do we do that? Well, we try to be the entity that puts most of the content on Twitter about Singapore. So this is what we've seen with, um, certainly in the, the Arab world, certain keywords are, I say polluted, and I say polluted because much of the content around those keywords is being promoted by these bots uh, with a specific message. So during the outbreak of the Qatar crisis in, um, in 2017, I, I thought, well, the target is Qatar in this case. So I will download any tweet mentioning the word Qatar. 
in Arabic or English, right? So I was just curious to see, to see what would happen. And it, it found that in the space of about two weeks um, that all the, uh, not all the, but the majority, um, the majority of any of the tweets mentioning the word Qatar were produced by bots. And most of those bots, in this case, were retweeting those uh, certain officials who represented the Saudi-led quartet side of the story. So one of the officials was um, an Qatari opposition guy living in London called Khaled al-Hal. And many of the tweets about Qatar were retweets of his tweets criticizing Qatar. So what this would suggest is that much of the discourse around Qatar at the time of the blockade, during the time of this kind of media campaign, um, was being promoted or being pushed forward by uh, some entity that wanted to um, criticize the Qatari government. So at the same time, the, the newspapers in Egypt, Saudi, UAE, and Bahrain were saying Qatar supports terrorism, Al Jazeera supports terrorism. There was also this kind of social media strategy. I'm not, I don't know who was behind it necessarily, but there was a social media strategy that was doing the same thing. It was basically trying to manipulate social media through trend manipulation, through polluting certain keywords, uh, in order to kind of um, promote a specific message. And, and, and so this was hugely significant at the time. And we're talking in the realm of tens of thousands of fake accounts, right? So now if you see a headline where Twitter says we've banned 200 accounts, it's really very little. You know, they make it sound like that's a huge thing. I mean, uh, uh, as an aside, uh, three years ago now, when I first started looking into bots, um, I was looking... Oh, sorry, this is just to go back a bit to what I was talking about. Um, yeah, so this graph, um, this is again a bit about the methodology that I use in terms of determining bots. What this graph shows on the left is the number of, essentially what is the number of tweets, or the number of accounts, Twitter accounts. Across the bottom are dates. So you can see 2012 to 2017. Um, and each column represents a month. What these show, if you put a sample of uh, Twitter accounts into, uh, you download them as a, from the API in a spreadsheet and put them into a, a visualization software, you can organize how many accounts, how many Twitter accounts were created in a certain day or month, right? So the whole premise here is anomaly detection. What you would expect in a normal sample of Twitter accounts, barring the fact that there might be some events where people join, et cetera, is that generally speaking, the number of accounts doesn't change a great deal per month or per day. So what we see here is, and the different colors represent different days within the month, the little colored lines. What you can see, if you look at the right, far right, is that the average amount of counts created per day uh, is about 306, oh, per month is about 367. Okay, 367. But then look how many counts were created in May 2017. So 3,347, okay. The majority of those were created on a specific day. And then once you have that, that's a huge anomaly, so that gives you a, a way to uh, focus your attention then. You can look at those accounts, and then you can find that they other similarities. We're tweeting from the same app. They all have very similar profile pictures or generic accounts. They literally all have the same timelines. All the content that they're retweeting is the same. You know with almost, uh, you know, uh, without much equivocation that those are fake accounts, that they're bot accounts. Um, and so what this just shows is this was the keyword sample of how many accounts were actually tweeting about Qatar that were bots um, at that specific time. Uh, and to go back, sorry, these slides are in the wrong order, but to go back to the point I was making earlier is that I have contacted Twitter about this before. So three years ago when I was first looking at bots, um, I, I found, I think it was about one, a few thousand fake accounts and I contacted Twitter and then they said, thank you, we'll put this to our uh, spam detection team and we'll get back to you. And so a few days later they got back to me and said, oh thanks, we banned 1,800 accounts. I was like, great. So I just updated my blog, said, oh yeah, you know, Twitter banned these 1,800 accounts. And Twitter got upset with me. They said that was confidential information that shouldn't have been broadcast. I was like, you didn't specify that that was confidential information. I wasn't to know. I mean, you know, I, I wouldn't assume that was confidential information. You know, I thought they'd be happy to kind of I was maybe naive, but I, was, I thought they'd be happy to kind of promote that. So from that point on, I became, I, I just chose not to deal with Twitter in a way because I felt that they were an adversary in this, and my continued work has suggested that. Um, but just to go back a bit, before the Qatar crisis, where I started working on bots was actually, um, and this is where my relationship with Panar comes in, 
is that I was looking at um, sectarian discourse uh, in the Middle East. So I was looking at hate speech in the Middle East in Arabic, uh, spe specifically sectarian hate speech. And I found that there's been studies done to see how, how, how common is uh, sectarian hate speech in the, in, in the Arab world, which countries use it more on Twitter, which don't. What I found when I started studying hate speech is that the majority of accounts that were promoting anti-Shia, this was mostly anti-Shia discourse, were not real accounts, they were bot accounts. Which again was like very interesting because it was suggested that again, some entity was trying to promote this uh, hate speech discourse, but it wasn't organic. And so when I contacted Twitter, it was about this specific incident. And what was quite funny is that when they said they banned the accounts, they didn't say we banned it because they were hate speech. They said we banned it because it was showing automated like behavior. So for them, the Twitter wasn't hate speech or anything like that. It was automated like behavior. Um, but this is, these bot networks are still ongoing. So when, again, Twitter talk about their purges of bots, um, you should always be a bit suspicious because they tend to mirror the certain political crisis at the time. So when ISIS was a big thing, Twitter were quite proud of saying, we've banned thousands of accounts linked to ISIS. During the Iran escalations now, that we've we banned hundreds of accounts promoting uh, Iranian, pro-Iranian propaganda. They never like to advertise, or in the case that I mentioned, where I personally got in touch with them, they haven't so far been keen to really advertise the fact that they've banned accounts related to Saudi Arabia, except in, in the Jamal Khashoggi case, but that's probably only because there was a huge amount of public pressure in that instance. So, I mean, this and other things have got me incredibly suspicious of Twitter's... Uh, Twitter's behavior in the region. One of the things that I think is important for everyone to know, um, most social media companies have to reach an agreement with, with governments in which they operate. The, the substance of Twitter's agreement with any of its countries in which it operates is unclear. So for example, we don't know what Twitter, Twitter's agreement with Saudi Arabia is. It's unlikely that most countries who have a, a highly censored media are just gonna tell and welcome in any social media company and allow them to do what they want. You know, For example, Netflix, um, Netflix took down the uh, Patriot Act episode with Hassan Minhaj in recently that criticized Mohammed bin Salman. And Netflix were honest about it. They took it down in Saudi Arabia because they said this episode is in breach of Saudi law. So we know Netflix are providing a good example of when a company has to comply with local law in the context. And as much as you know, no one really likes that kind of thing, at least they're, they're being honest about it. And they're showing that they also have to comply to local law, but we're not quite clear with some companies how they are in compliance with local law uh, on certain issues. Twitter especially uh, are kind of opaque about that. And more and more has been written actually on, on um, the funding of Silicon Valley companies through SoftBank who are then capitalized by lots of, um, uh, uh, in this case, Emirati and Saudi finance. So there's some, some debate. There was an article, uh, I think, last year in the New York Times that discussed the amount of money coming from the Middle East indirectly into Silicon Valley. And there was expressing worries how this money could be, be used um, in untransparent ways. Let's put it that way. <coughs> so the last case I want to talk about, we talked about trend manipulation. We talked about promoting specific messages uh, uh, to the, uh, and we've, we talked specifically also about um, just dominating and polluting certain uh, topics through, through swamping, by just producing, dominating the discourse. What I want to talk now about is the, again, we're talking a bit about twin, Twitter's trending function, but I want to talk about specifically the case of Jamal Khashoggi. Now, what was interesting about Jamal Khashoggi is that um, it was a huge news event for, for for a, a long time, but specifically of October last year, it dominated the headlines. It was a massive thing. And in the Middle East, in the Arabic-speaking world, it was, if you watched any Arabic uh, broadcaster, regardless of where it was based, they would be talking about Jamal Khashoggi almost for a whole, uh, at least a month. And part of this was because the story kept changing. Initially, the Saudis denied it happened. They claimed he left the building. They dressed someone else up as Khashoggi. <laughs> Eventually, they had to confront the fact that they were lying and that they changed the discourse. So what's very interesting about the Jamal Khashoggi case, we know for a period of time that the, the Saudi government were lying. So we can, we can categorize that as either fake or propaganda news because we know they, they even admitted. They didn't admit they were lying. They just changed the story, which is basically admitting they were lying. And because of the way they dragged it out, we couldn't find the body the fact that it was a journalist, it meant that this was covering, uh, it was dominating the news for a long time. So one of the projects I, was, uh, I, I, I worked on here was to analyze, okay, we've looked at trend suppression, we've looked at trend manipulation, we've looked at 
what's trending in certain Arabic countries. So let's take the case study of Jamal Khashoggi. Let's see if uh, Jamal Khashoggi was trending in the Arab-speaking world. My hypothesis was fairly straightforward. It was like, in Saudi Arabia, they won't want to talk about the Jamal Khashoggi thing. They won't want people to talk about it, right? Because it's a very sensitive subject. It would undermine MBS's proposed reforms. Uh, and it looks bad, essentially. And on the converse thing, I thought, Qatar, on the other hand, would want to make the most of Jamal Khashoggi's killing because they'd been blockaded by these countries and this made Saudi look bad, so they'd want to promote this message. So the methodology was fairly straightforward. I used a trend archiving database, just a website that documents what's trending in specific countries every day. And, and then the premise was simple. It was look at what's trended in every Arabic-speaking country for the month of October 2018 when Jamal Khashoggi went missing. And the idea was that every time Jamal Khashoggi is mentioned in a trending topic, whether in English or Arabic, make a note of that, right? So the idea was to see on every day how many times did Jamal Khashoggi trend in specific countries. Um, so I did this for the whole month of October. And what you can see here is, and, and bear in mind a few things that are important to remind you, Saudi Arabia has the largest Twitter population in the Arabic-speaking world. Saudi Arabia was implicated in the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, well, the Saudi regime were. Um, the lowest, the, the country where Jamal Khashoggi's name appeared lowest in terms of trends was, yes, well look at this, Saudi Arabia, right? The highest was Qatar, okay? So I was like amazed by this, but even though this was my hypothesis, this, is, this was really surprising to me, is that the most common hashtag, Jamal underscore Khashoggi in Arabic, trended the least in Saudi Arabia, okay? And trended the most in Qatar, which I might expect. Um, and that, you know. Wait. Wait, which you did expect. I, I did expect, that was my hypothesis based on the assumption that there was some sort of suppression going on. Because my assumption, I'm, I've become very cynical, so my assumption was that, the assumption was if this was just, um, if I didn't expect any interference, I would expect maybe Saudi to have the highest number of, of returns because, you know, there's lots of Saudis that are talking about it. But because I suspect that there's something happening here, my hypothesis was then that it would be the lowest. Um, and the hypothesis, the cynical hypothesis, was correct. Uh, and we saw that the, the majority of um, the majority of tweets about Jamal Khashoggi were from Qatar, and the least were from Saudi. In the trending archive, right? So someone might say, "Well, what about the content of the tweets? Maybe Saudis were afraid to tweet about Jamal Khashoggi," which is a fair assumption, given that uh, there's been a chilling effect since MBS has come through. So what, what can we do? We can look at the contents of the tweet. So when I, well, my colleague and I, we downloaded, um, I think we had several million tweets. And the majority, of, when you download a sample of tweets, just FYI, the majority will always be retweets, people just retweeting certain messages, usually 80%, maybe 70, sometimes 90. And what we did, we just ordered the tweets. So we ordered the, the top, the, the most occurring retweets. So we had a chart of about 100 of the top tweets. You know, some were retweeted tens of thousands of times. And we ordered them to see what they were tweeting about. What we found, I mean, if your hypothesis was that, OK, maybe people were afraid to tweet because there was no trending in Saudi, what tweets would you expect to see? Well, I mean, we'd expect to see not many tweets uh, from Saudi or, you know, generally. But what we found is the, the most popular tweets in that sample were, pr were promoting the Saudi side of the story. So they were promoting the news that we know to be fake because, again, we knew it was fake. They were promoting stuff that, you know, like Jamal Khashoggi, uh, this is like a Turkish conspiracy or that Jamal left the building. So the most common tweets in the sample were the Saudi... Uh, the Saudi news media tweets, yet they had the lowest return in terms of trend. So what would explain that? I don't know. This is what, you know, this is the, we can only, uh, from this, without being working in Twitter, without knowing what agreements Twitter might have with the government, with, without knowing if any algorithms being exploited, I don't know. But what we can say with certainty is that there's some sort of trend suppression going on. People or certainly Saudi Arabia has the ability to manipulate Twitter trends to promote certain messages and hide other messages. And it doesn't mean you can't find these things. You can, but you have to know what you're looking for. It's not like the dark web, because it's not the sinister, but it's the same premise in that you need to know exactly what you're looking for to find it. It won't just 
appear as easily in, in, in certain search results. So that, that to me is, is again one of, the most, uh, one of the most disturbing things about the social media story about the Jamal Khashoggi thing. And in addition to that, a lot of the, the, the Saudi side of the story is promoted by bots. But this to me is, is a larger problem. Uh, people are not being, uh, it's not that people aren't talking about things, it's that they are, but it's the way it's being curated is being manipulated. So to conclude, I just, I just have a, a kind of, um, I mean, I have a few things, that, you know, a few takeaways is, 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 is the obvious ones is that social media is not a good barometer for public opinion, so always be careful. Uh, even when things might seem credible, like a screenshot of a news article, it's not the case. It's my 45 minute alarm. Didn't even need it. Um, and um, we know that there's certain, like Saud al uh, there are certain government figures, in this case Saud al Qatani, who have deliberately, or I would say deliberately, been aware of this kind of manipulation and are engaging in it. Um, but the biggest thing, I think, structurally, is it's not so much what governments are doing. It's what social media companies are allowed to get away with. Now, we've seen with, with, with sort of, most of you would have seen Mark Zuckerberg talking to Congress, and we, you saw examples of how American congressmen were, were not very equipped to ask him the right kind of questions, you know. Um, so that always alarms me, because as we've seen with a few of these cases, is that governments seem to be a bit far behind what these social media companies are doing. And I think the same is, is certainly true with Twitter is that Twitter are able to, Twitter have a big impact, and um, as, as someone who generally doesn't always is, uh, condone like over-regulation, they are probably able to combat this if they wanted to. And that's what really bothers me about it. Uh, one of the ways that I, I think you could easily do this is have a better verification system. You know? Twitter have a very um, elitist verification policy. So you know, you, you know, it's, it's a verification policy would just allow, it gives you that blue tick which basically says that I'm a real person. And for me, who's very cynical now, it is useful because it allows me to see that, well, this person at least has shown their passport to Twitter uh, and that they are a real person. And then, of course, you worry that, do I really want Twitter to have my passport? That's a separate debate. But if you want to get rid of these fake accounts, how do you do it? You just make sure that any account that joins the system is a real one. It's a real person or representing a real agency. Now, Twitter have done that but they don't roll that everyone. They rolled it out publicly for a while and then they stopped doing it. Currently, they've suspended the verification program. Uh, ironically, they suspended it to work on interference in the next election, to focus on that. I sort of thought, well, if you focus on verification, maybe you could kill two birds with one stone. Um, so that's, that's one thing that I think would be really important and I think needs to be encouraged. Um, but at the same time, I think people have lost a lot of faith in social media companies, so I don't think people will feel very good about giving um, personal information to companies like Twitter. But also the verif verification twist system is kind of broken. Um, a recent investigation I did earlier this year showed that a number of verified accounts had been hacked and then were promoting Saudi propaganda. So there was an American weatherman called David Schwartz who died two years ago. He even has an obituary in the New York Times. You know, uh, and somehow someone had got hold of his account, uh, some region in Saudi, and was uh, tweeting on it. There was a few other verified accounts, uh, one belonging to an Olympic, an, uh, an Olympian, I can't remember, Nicole Jade Smith, Australian Olympian, and she was again tweeting um, pro-Saudi propaganda at some point in the timeline. And the, the, the ridiculous thing here is that David, this David Schwartz guy, who, and the reason I choose him as an example, he was a weatherman, he was known to people, he had a fan base, he had an obituary in the New York Times, his account is still up there. There's no picture anymore, there's no image, but it's still a verified account with his name. So does that mean Twitter, I mean that means one of several things, that Twitter know about it and they don't care, they know about it, they can't do anything, or they don't know about it. It's one of those options, and I doubt they don't know about it. Um, and, and it's quite alarming uh, that this kind of happens. So verification isn't like a silver bullet, but it, it could certainly help. Um, I mean, and another problem is, is that now I'm doing another study of who, who like Twitter hegemony, who, where are the most verified accounts? You know, like, so if you actually now download all the verified Twitter accounts in the Middle East, you'll see that the majority of Arabic language Twitter accounts that are verified are based in Saudi Arabia. So you can make an argument again that in terms of the, the kind of what is perceived as credible news or credible Twitter accounts, the dom the, the, most of them are in Saudi Arabia, followed by the United Arab Emirates. So there's, a, there's definitely an argument to be made that structurally in the Arabic-speaking world, 
that information produced on Twitter in Arabic reflects the, uh, the, political, uh, the foreign policy of countries like Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, and to an extent Egypt. Um, but you can also make another point to know that um, it's, Twitter doesn't operate in a very transparent way, and there's a lot of questions that need to be asked about how they operate. But yes, um, I'm sure some of you have some questions, so I'll end there, and again, thank you very much for listening.